Guys, I was a victim of a crypto hack where my wallet was compromised by an attacker and all my money was stolen. And I was completely pwned because of one really dumb mistake. And I'm gonna tell you exactly what happened in this video, give you all the details so that you don't do the exact same thing. Because I see stories like this all the time where people are losing insane amounts of money because they fail to protect their crypto. You know, this happened to me personally and it's one of the reasons I'm so big about crypto security and talk about it so much on this channel because I've had to learn these lessons the hard way and I wanna keep you from doing the same. So before we get into that, if you're new around here, you know, hey, I'm Gregory, and on this channel, I turn you into a blockchain master. So if that's something that you're interested in, then smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm and subscribe to this channel. And if you want to learn how to master blockchain step by step from start to finish, then head on over to adaptuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp to get started today. All right, so let's jump into this. Let's talk about this story about how I got hacked, how my wallet was compromised, and how all my money was taken from me. Looking back on this, this is kind of an embarrassing story to tell you the truth that I really don't like to tell because I'm always thinking to myself, especially like knowing what I know now with all the experience that I have, like how how stupid could you be? But then when I think about it, like I see lots of other people making these same types of mistakes and it's not because they're stupid, it's just because they don't really know any better in most cases. And so that was definitely my story because this was several years ago in the early phases of my development career when I made a critical mistake simply because I was super green and didn't know any better. All right, so let's talk about exactly how this happened. So again, this was in the very early days of my blockchain development career when I really just got into the space and was building my first projects. And you have to understand that like back then, uh, you didn't exactly have the same type of resources that you have available now to understand how this technology works. So like we were really having to figure out a lot of things from scratch. So, you know, I had built this project uh, where essentially there was a blockchain protocol that had a token associated with it as well, okay? And this token had a you know pretty significant function in the ecosystem. So we built this protocol, we built this token, and we put it out there live on the blockchain. This was a really big deal because, again, you know, while you might see how straightforward this stuff is now because, you know, everybody's done it. We have all these DeFi protocols out there, all these NFTs where you can see, oh, yeah, you just go launch a new protocol, launch a new token. Like, this was all this was all brand new. And so there's so many things to figure out. And once we had something out there live on the blockchain, this was, this was really amazing. And so sitting there, you know, watching this thing uh, actually grow and get some type of adoption was, was huge. And so, you know, once it was out there, we would watch this project on a day-to-day -day basis. We'd closely monitor all the activity associated with it. And then one morning, I woke up to see that the funds held in the treasury wallet, you know, the reserves of the actual cryptocurrency associated with the project had moved, okay? And that's not exactly the type of thing you want to see, you know, first thing in the morning because, you know, it's like one minute, all the funds are there. The next minute, they're gone to a brand new address that you've never seen before. And so after an extensive investigation, we found out that it indeed was a hack. Okay, so an attacker would gain access to a wallet that was able to move the funds out of this treasury to their own wallet and control them. Okay, and upon further investigation, we were trying to figure out, you know, how exactly did that happen? It's because the, you know, attacker was able to obtain access to a private key you know, associated with this wallet. And they gained access to this because it was, you know, stored in, you know, just wait for it, cloud storage, you know, womp womp. And so if you're an experienced developer and you're like me, like you listen to this story and you're like, oh my gosh, like how on earth could somebody make that mistake? But then again, like I was saying, this was many, many years ago, in my very early phases of my development career. And it's the same type of mistake that I see lots of other people making all the time. So I sort of just forgive myself for that one. And the other thing, is this didn't really have that big of a long-term impact in the project because it was very early. We were able to essentially rebuild the project from scratch and not have to really worry about this. We were able to fork it essentially without the transactions where the you know the attacker was able to compromise the funds. It didn't really compromise the long-term vision of the project. So it was all well and good in the long run. So let's jump into exactly you know what went wrong here and how other people are doing the same types of things and how you can protect yourself. Because that's ultimately why I'm making this video. Again, I don't love telling this story, but it's so I can help you all because I see lots of people doing the exact same thing. So let's start off with, you know, your private key uh, for your cryptocurrency account. OK, so if you're using the blockchain, whether you're just making transactions inside of a MetaMask account or you're just holding cryptocurrency or if you're a developer like me and you're having to put smart contracts on the network and actually interact with you know projects through some scripts or something like that. You typically have to, you know, generate a private key so that you can, you know, interact with an account. So, you know, you can see a list of public key, uh, private key pairs here or account in private key pairs. This is with hard hat. OK, so this is a development blockchain. Uh, it's generally not best practice to show private keys on screen, uh, just like I'm talking about in this video for the exact same reasons. 
But these are development accounts, okay? So definitely, if you're watching this video, don't try to store any cryptocurrency in these accounts, okay? I just want to use this as an example to talk about what public keys and private keys are. So basically, you know, your uh, this is your account address. You're probably familiar with this. This is the private key, okay? So your account address is a is a is a is a representation of your public key, and it's sort of like your username in the blockchain. And you know, this private key here is a password. So basically, you can always generate your public key from the private key or your account from the private key. And if you have uh, the private key, you really have the keys to the kingdom. Like that's what it's for. It's about digital signatures. You you can sign any transaction you want to on behalf of the person who represents this account to authorize any transaction on the blockchain. That's how the blockchain verifies that it's you. Okay. So essentially, uh, this is what was compromised in my project. Someone was able to gain access to a private key that was then able to, you know, make uh, unauthorized transfers. Uh, of funds out of this project. And many other people are suffering the same types of attacks where they store their private keys somewhere and someone gets access to them and is able to take all their money out of their wallet. So let's talk about the different ways that this happens. So for developers, this is a huge issue. So if you're watching this channel and you're, you are a blockchain developer, you're trying to become one, um, then you have a special issue, which is basically what happens to me, okay? Uh, where, you know, you, you're going to have to use private keys for, you know, projects. You have to put smart contracts on a blockchain. You might just sign transactions to use an application that's already deployed. And so private key storage uh, is huge here. So whether you're putting the smart contracts in the blockchain, you typically have to have some sort of environment, uh, you know, files like a .emv file inside your project where you save a private key to sign transactions. This is not the only way to do it, but it's a really common way to do it. Okay, maybe in hard hat or truffle. And then what happens is, uh, a lot of times people will commit this code accidentally and push up to the cloud, maybe to a public GitHub repo. And so like, there's always bots watching for this stuff. So that's rule number one is if you ever have a .env file, make sure it's always in your Git ignore, okay? Because if you push that up to GitHub, then there's always bots watching for that that can completely clean you out. Another good ground rule here is if you ever have to use a private key for a development project like this, a, a good ground rule is to have one private key for project. So... You know, if you accidentally made a mistake where you committed an .env file or a private key to source code, uh, source history, excuse me, somewhere, then you wouldn't be able to compromise all your projects. It would just be one project, okay? And another good ground rule is that every development account that you shoot, that you use, you should never store any real amount of cryptocurrency that you need for like trading or long-term storage. Because if somebody ever compromised your developer account, then, you know, they could take your money. Because you have to see the fundamental problem with this is if you have a .env like this, this is just what's called plain text. Because anybody who looked at this file could see uh, the private key. Like if they were watching this video, for example, if they obtained access to screen sharing and they saw this or they just got your computer somehow, they if they just see this file, then they can know, they know your private key and they could you know drain your wallet. So how do you take you know steps to to go beyond that? Well, lots of people are going to use .env files anyway. Okay, it's not the biggest deal in the world if you follow the best practices like I was talking about a minute ago. Basically, you know, single use private keys and then also uh, not storing any real money in it. But if you're talking about the next level where you're having to run maybe an application in the cloud, like I was talking about before, or you need to authorize transactions maybe on a scheduled basis, then you don't you don't necessarily want to have private keys like laying around in plain text on servers. Because that's the sort of the issue that I was talking about in the subject of this video is basically private keys stored in the cloud. So, how can you make protections against that? Well, essentially, you can encrypt private keys. You know, so they're not just stored in plain text, either inside a database or inside some sort of file uh, in the cloud. Okay, you can use like a JSON key store where someone has to password uh, protect the 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 file itself. If they're going to make it a, a transaction, they have to have an additional. A password in order to do that. The whole idea is somebody found that key store file, they don't just ha instantly have access to the kingdom. You know, they have an additional layer of uh, authentication required in order to make transactions. All right, so another major issue that I see all the time is basically people backing up their crypto wallets um, with their seed phrase or their private keys and storing that information somewhere digitally that's completely unencrypted, unprotected. This is an absolute no-no, okay? So you might have seen something like this, like a piece of paper where you're writing your down your recovery seed phrase, okay? So again, your seed phrase is just a string of human readable words that helps you regenerate a list of wallets, okay? Just like MetaMask, for example, like it's got a seed phrase that you can back that up uh, or even, even the private keys themselves. And here's a mistake that I see people all the time. They're like writing down their seed phrase or their private keys into a text file and saving it on their computer or they're putting it in like Dropbox or like Notion or Evernote or something like that and putting it in the cloud. Okay, that's an absolute no-no because if somebody, again, compromises your computer, and that stuff is stored in plain text, and they obtain access to that text itself, okay, then they can just clean you, completely clean you out. 
um, or if they, you know, hacked your Dropbox or if they, you know, hacked your Notion or Evernote or whatever it is, they can instantly get that information. Because especially with cloud services like Dropbox and the others that I was talking about, people are notorious for not uh, using unique passwords per website. So you can see a website like this, like haveibeenpwned.com. You can enter in your email address and see if your login information has been compromised on any website. So the whole idea is like, if you stored stuff in Dropbox, okay, and then you also have a Gmail account or whatever, or and you have a Facebook account, and then let's say you also bought something on a really sketchy e-commerce website one time and you had to create a username and password, and then that e-commerce website got hacked, and they were able to figure out your password, and it's the same password for your Dropbox, well, guess what? Now they can log into your Dropbox because you put in you know, the same data to this really, you know, sketchy site that had horrible security, okay? And then they can log into your Dropbox and then find out where you save, you know, your crypto private keys. And you, you think that someone has to spend a bunch of time doing this, but a lot of this is completely automated because the hackers are uh, very fast and efficient at doing this type of thing. They can instantly just scrape stuff and just log into accounts and start like, you know, crawling through them to see if they can find information they can instantly drain. Um, that's how they do that type of thing. And so that's why you never want to write down your seed phrase and store it in plain text in the cloud or your private key either for your actual crypto wallets you're holding, you know, coins or NFTs inside of, okay? So another big thing is, I mean, I see people like taking pictures of these types of things and storing them on their iPhone or their Android and not realizing that those photos are automatically backed up into your iCloud or whatever, you know, syncing service you use for your Android device, okay? Automatically without them really knowing it. And so that's another you know, point of failure. We've seen iCloud hacks happen in the past, so they're not immune from this type of thing either. So definitely don't take pictures of it and think that's going to offer you better sense of security either. So the general rule of thumb for you know private keys and seed phrases is either offline or some type of encrypted backup. And so that leads me to the final thing to talk about here, which are hardware wallets, okay? So hardware wallets can be a really good option for this because you know private key never has to leave the hardware wallet device itself. That's the whole benefit of it. So you're never having to like write down a private key and, or it's not inside of a MetaMask account. And you know you have to have this hardware layer of authentication in order to sign transactions. Nobody could ever just you know get that private key and then do something uh, unauthorized with it without having the hardware. Now of course if they had the, the uh, private key associated with the device, they could do that. But the whole idea of the hardware wallet is it's completely stored on there. Okay, so you know. I, I think there's also an additional downside of hardware wallets where it gives people a false sense of security. But if you understand exactly what they do and how they work and what they're for, then this can give people a significant additional layer of protection. But, you know, if you take your seed phrase for your hardware wallet and you store it in the cloud like I was talking about before, that's not going to give you any protection at all. Okay, so you definitely want to uh, back them up in an appropriate way. I'm not necessarily recommending any specific hardware wallet. Uh, you know, there's some options you can see here. But, you know, implementing a hardware wallet with the right you know, strategies can help uh, mitigate some of these problems I'm talking about. All right, so that's the story of how I was hacked, okay? And the stupid mistake that I made, you know, really early on in my development career and, you know, what I learned from this. And again, I don't love telling this story, but the reason I do it is so that I can help you all avoid the same types of mistakes because uh, I see lots of the people doing the exact same type of thing. So I hope you like this video. Yeah, as always, smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm. Subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. That really helps these videos out so the more people can learn about blockchain. And if you're as fascinated with this technology as I am, you want to get your hands dirty, how can you get started today? You can go to my YouTube homepage. You can find those free courses there. They're like Udemy courses, but they're totally free. And if you'd like those and you want to take the next step, or hey, maybe you'll take a master's shortcut entirely, I can show to master blockchain step-by-step start to finish over at dappuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp. You'd have to be an expert to get started today. I've helped people with zero coding experience become real-world blockchain developers in a matter of months. So that's all I've got. And until next time, thanks for watching Dapp University.